A little bit about our speaker here. Uh, Susan Kelsey is an author, historian, documentarian, and financial advisor who uh, lived in the Saganash neighborhood of Chicago on the site of Billy Caldwell's former 1,600-acre uh, reserve. Uh, so this is kind of where, where she got started, learning about the history of uh, Chief Saganash Billy Caldwell. Over the course of 25 years, it's uh, 30 now. 30? Oh my gosh. <laughs> that's right, that's right. There's even more going on since the book has been first released. Uh, she's followed Caldwell's trail through two county, two countries, 13 states, thousands of miles, and uh, has done met so many different people, including these intersecting, intersecting stories about Irish Native Americans and learning more about the development of America. And uh, in addition to the book, which there's a couple copies of hanging on the table there, uh, 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 Susan is also developing a documentary about Billy Caldwell, which I believe is released this year? Next year. Next year. <laughs> I know, all these things always get messed up, don't they? Well, yes, but please keep an eye out for the documentary as well, produced uh, with the Potawatomi. So it should be a really fantastic uh, documentary. So, without further ado, Susan. Thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone, can you hear me okay? I'm mic'd up. It's really nice to be here. I used to live in Saganash. My parents lived in Arlington Heights, my brother in Mount Prospect. So I would take 14 back and forth all the time. So some days I couldn't get around the Des Plaines River. That's how many years I've been here, but I'm happy to be here. So I have, uh, we'll talk a little bit about who Billy Caldwell is. Does any, anyone know who Billy Caldwell is? No, okay, so this is gonna be fun. Maybe a little bit. And then we'll take a little journey about where he came from, why he was important to Chicago, and then what happened to him when he left. And then, um, and happy to answer any questions. If you have a question during the presentation, go ahead and ask it. If it gets too crazy, then we'll just hold them to the end. So I love this picture. It's on the cover of the book. It's, it's, there's no copyright on it. It was made in 1755 by a French map uh, and explorer. And it just shows his interpretation of what the Great Lakes look like. And if you know anything about Native American history in the Midwest, you know, during late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, a lot of the Native Americans, I'll make this the East Coast, this is the West Coast. So the East Coast are getting pushed out. So the East Coast Indians are pushing into the Midwest, created a lot of conflict. And eventually here in Illinois, they were all pushed west. So love this map and let's get started. So I'm often asked, what does Billy Caldwell look like? We do not have any picture of him. However, there's an artist in Ohio, he has since passed, um, Hal Sherman, and he painted a lot of historical images. And this was his interpretation of what he thought Billy Caldwell would look like. Um, on the right, in the green jacket, is his father. We do have a picture of William Caldwell. And William Caldwell fought in the Butler's Rangers, which was a British, kind of like our version of the SEAL team you know, special forces. I mean, they were really a tough group. So we know that his father is from Ireland, and we think the northern part of Ireland, and came over around the 17, mid 1770s, around there, 1760, maybe earlier. We're not sure where he came in. I've been trying to trace his history. It might be down in Virginia. He had a brother that was famous down there. And, but as we were talking earlier today, it's very hard to verify information, particularly with Native Americans. So. You try to find every possible research and cross-reference, but we know he came over. He um, uh, didn't marry, but he had um, Billy Caldwell with a Native American woman who was Mohawk. Although as we get more and more information online, we're not really sure she's Mohawk. So that's what you'll find through this whole presentation is uh, Billy Caldwell is an, an enigma. He's just, there, he's a complex character. There's not a lot of written, primary resources, so we try to take what we can. The best resources we have found are the Catholic um, historical records, the missionaries and their notes, and then the U.S. Army. And so, but we don't really have a lot from the Native American perspective. You know, a lot of their history is oral history. So we try to take those three points and see what the real story is. In the middle is Tecumseh. So Tecumseh and William Caldwell, the father, were comrades in battle, and they fought a lot of fights together. The, Medal of the Thames where Tecumseh got killed. And so when you think about that relationship, you know, he must have been a mentor to Billy Caldwell. So Billy is half Irish, half Native American, we think the Mohawk. 
It's the Algonquin tribe, which is kind of the umbrella tribe. Then you have a British soldier and then General Isaac Brock, who led a lot of the wars in Britain. So that's what we think he looks like. We did find some notes from Missouri that Caldwell was about six feet, three inches tall, narrow, athletic, um, charming. He must have had a lot of charisma to get the job done that he got done. So, so we have some facts on what he looked like. But um, just some background for you. On the left-hand side, let's just talk about, in general, what was going on in the United States. So about the year Columbus came over, there were anywhere between 5 and 15 million indigenous people living here. And these, this is from the Smithsonian Institute, the Museum of the American Indians, so I'm taking their facts. As we get closer to the 1800s, there's about 600,000 Native Americans. And then as we start getting to the end of the 1800s, you know, Geronimo is out. They're moving out west and killing all the Indians out there. And we're down to about a quarter million of Native Americans, down from the millions that there were. But the good news is, is today there's about five million, and they represent 600 sovereign nations. So a sovereign nation is um, a legal entity. It's its own government that has the ability to negotiate with the United States government. And over the course of those years, there were about 374 treaties that were done, but almost every one of them were broken. So if we get a little bit more local here in Illinois, today we have about 100, it's between 100 and 150,000 Native Americans. About uh, 60,000 of them are up in the Chicago area, the rest of them through the rest of the state. The land that we're on here, especially in Des, Des Plaines, because you had the river there, and it wasn't that they canoed it so much, that was a little bit earlier, you know, by then they had horses. But it, you know, what comes to the river? Well, there's fish in the river and turtles, and what comes to eat that? Animals and critters, and it's food. So that's why they were along the Des Plaines River a lot. And so the land we're on was Illini, Ojibwe, Fox, Potawatomi, Ottawa, Sauk, and Kickapoo. But of course, Native Americans have been here 11,000 years. So there are thousands of other types of tribes and people, and even they didn't think of themselves that way. But there have been Native Americans on this land long time, long more, longer time than we've been here. Uh, in Chicago, we have a number of Indian, um, American Indian um, organizations. There is the American Indian Center of Illinois. There is the American Indian Association of Illinois. There is the Mitchell Indian Museum of the American Indian. I sit on that board. And then there's a brand new Native American Chamber of Commerce. So there, there are Native Americans here today. <laughs> and we'll talk a little bit about that. When I moved to Chicago, 1985, so um, you guys probably remember that. I do talk to audiences that are like, this seems like so ancient, you know. <laughs> but when I, I worked down by Michigan and Wacker, so this is on the side of the bridge at Michigan and Wacker. And before I ever, I eventually moved up to Saugenash neighborhood. So, but even before I got there, I would look at this and kind of wonder about Chicago history and why was this on the side of the wall? So I'd go to Newberry Library or the Chicago History Center and try to just learn a little bit more, but it always kind of interested me and, um, and that's where the journey started to begin. Then in 1993, I moved to Saugenash neighborhood, which is at Peterson and Cicero. You go one more street light north and you're in Skokie. So we're at the very northern edge <coughs> of Chicago. <coughs> and we, my husband and I moved there, and I was walking around the neighborhood and saw this plaque on the ground and started reading it and talks about Billy Caldwell and signing a treaty in Fort Dearborn. And I started thinking back about that mural that I had seen and started doing more research. Who was this guy, you know, Billy Caldwell? He was also known as Chief Saganash. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. But So this is where the story begins, 1993, before the Internet. Um, then life happens, so I've been at this 30 years, the internet comes, I have kids, you know, I work. <laughs> so I put the story down, pick it back up, and, and just finished the book, 2019, and had a book launch January 20, and then you know what happened, you know, after that. So everybody went underground, and then I decided, well, the story's not done yet, so then I thought, I'll make a movie about it. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing now. But here's Caldwell's Reserve. So what was so special about him? Beside the fact that he was half, uh, he was a Métis, which is half Native American, half European heritage, um, he negotiated two of the major treaties in the Chicago area. The 1829 treaty, 
which was the Prairie du Chien Treaty, and um, then the last one was the 1833 Treaty, where Billy Caldwell, Alexander Robinson, and Chief Chabonnet negotiated five million acres and to cede five million acres and for all the Native Americans within two years to move west out of Illinois. So what Caldwell, and there were other men that were involved in that too, and a lot of people, we never know who they will be. But um, what was so significant about that? For the first time in a treaty, individuals received land, and that had not been the case in other treaties, but wouldn't it be Chicago, right? <laughs> that we'd find a way to, for everyone to monetize a treaty. So Caldwell received 1,600 acres, and this is his land. I was down in the bottom corner, uh, Forest Glen, south of Peterson, where it dead ends into, um, it doesn't dead end, it crosses Caldwell Avenue, and that's where that plaque is. But it goes kind of northwest, and it follows the Des Plaines River. I mean, that was hot real estate then. It had the resources. They could have water. They could have food. They could have land, a place to be. Transportation, the trails were already there. You know, for hundreds of years, trail marker trees showing them directions north to Milwaukee or Green Bay or down to Chicago. So it was very um, desirable land. And so he received 1,600 acres. And when he left, uh, he sold all of it. And he left with his people. So when I lived in Saganash, I was, I was kind of wondered, where did he come from? You know, once I started learning more about him, where did he come from and what happened to him when he left? So... I thought I'd take a little trip. <laughs> and uh, I asked my mom if she wanted to go with me. And we decided to go up to um, where he was born. So Fort Niagara, which is just north of Niagara Falls, about 10 or 15 miles. The French built a fort. I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. But the French built a fort up there. Of course, you know, we're in the, um, when he was born, 1780. So right after the signing of the Declaration, right? Our, we have a kind of a new country that's being born here. And so he was up in this area, and he was on the British side. And so we went up to follow his trail. So from Fort Dearborn, or Fort Niagara, uh, he eventually comes down to Amherstburg, which is south of Windsor across the river from Detroit, if you've ever been on the Detroit River. And then he came to Chicago, early 1800s. And then once he left Chicago, 1835, or about, yeah, the fall of 1835, he crosses the Mississippi River at Oquaka, goes up in Iowa a little bit, camps at Mount Pleasant, and then he goes down to St. Joseph because that's where the action is, okay? So we have the, the Splains River, we have the Mississippi River, and the Missouri River, and St. Joseph is on the Missouri River. And, of course, the French have already started coming up from the south, right, from um, the, the fur trading there. So he wanted to be where the action was, but he could only stay there about 18 months. And then they wrote, you know, they went back to the Louisiana Purchase, that this little triangle left in Missouri was not in that purchase. So then they um, ratified it, and so then all the Native Americans in Missouri, everybody had to move west of the Missouri, except Billy Caldwell. <laughs> he went up to Council Bluffs, Iowa. So that's his trail. So here's Fort Niagara. This still stands. It's about 300 years old built by the French, occupied by French, Spanish, British, and Americans. Today, it's a, it's a New York State Park. You can go there, and they have these demonstrations of the canyons and stuff. But um, So I went here, and Caldwell was born outside of the fort because he was a Métis, a half-breed, you know, half Native American, half European. They were not allowed inside the fort walls. So his mother and him stayed there. His father had already left and gone down to Amherstburg, and met a new woman, um, Suzanne Baby, and married her. She was French-Canadian and from a very wealthy family. So his father was very um, aggressive and you know, uh, gregarious and decided he was going to go down in there. So, so now we're jumping to Chicago, but let me just fill in the gap. So he's in, he's in no, Fort Niagara, and his, the, new, the new wife, Suzanne Baby, reads that the firstborn child has hereditary rights to land. So she tells William Caldwell, go up there and get your son because, you know, we need to bring him into the fold here. And so after that, William Caldwell, I think, had another nine kids or so. And, yeah, <laughs> and uh, with the same woman. And then, um, but then the laws changed. And then there became this kind of 
competition between father and son, William Caldwell and his son. So uh, Billy Caldwell left and he decided he was going to try to find a new career and a new life. And so he started trading in Detroit, went over to St. Joseph, Michigan, did fur trading at that time. And the reason fur trading was so important is Europe was running out of resources for felt. You know, they were making the top hats and the top coats and they would take the beaver fur and it's got little hooks on it. So they'd rub it, rub it, rub it together and that's what was creating the felt. So they were, they couldn't get enough beaver fur. So they were drawing, that was pretty much why they started coming into the Great Lakes, the Hudson Bay Company and American Fur Company. So then Caldwell goes over to Chicago, which is here. And I show this and it's very complicated and you don't have to read it all because I'll show a more blown up picture. But it's the original um, site of Fort Dearborn before they straightened out you know, that sandbar there. But what I absolutely love about this story is where I have my yellow stars. And this is what I found over the past 30 years is this kind of community and friends that Caldwell had. And it helped really you know, piece things together. I would get phone calls about five years ago. I got a phone call from the Lafram Bois family. He's, you know, and I get these phone calls, did you know, did you know? So it, it really is helpful to kind of piece it all together. So I'll read through the names. Antoine Wilmet, so we know the suburb, Wilmet. Below him, uh, Bobian, Indian trader and tavern, and then William Caldwell. By then they had named him chief. So the white people gave him that title so he would negotiate the treaties on behalf of the white people. It wasn't, he wasn't even Potawatomi. He wasn't with any of the tribes here. He was, he was Mohawk, which was upstate New York, and eventually they went up into Canada where, after uh, the U.S. and Canada created the border. In the middle column, Alexander Robinson uh, was an Indian trader, Mark Bobian, Medora Bobian, and Leon Barroso. So these names really helped me later when I was trying to figure out what happened to Billy Caldwell. But Billy had two buddies, and one was Alexander Robinson, and I'm, I, I always have to refer back in writing the details, so I won't tell you what tribe he's with. And then Chief Chabonet. And these three guys, you know, kind of, you know, ran Chicago. And so Alexander Robinson in the treaty received land, and it's south of here on the river at uh, Riverwoods Road and Lawrence. And there is a big stone there that shows, and he stayed here. So he had a house there, he got married, um, Kath, his wife Kathleen Chavignet we had the land north, so the park is named Chavignet Woods and then Robinson Woods. And then the other one was Chief Chabonet, and Chabonet decided to stay in Illinois. So that was one of the questions I had is why did Caldwell leave and his two buddies stay here with their property? And uh, the, you know, the answer is we think, I mean all we, everything's always kind of a theory, is that by then Caldwell had lost his third wife and lost a lot of his children where Robinson had a big family, Chabonet um, had a big family and so they, it wasn't as easy to pick up this family and move. So Caldwell, you know, he's, he's been looking for a home for a while so he decided he would leave. So that's our theory but when he left, finding some of these names at the two tribes, at the Prairie Band Potawatomi tribe in Kansas and the Citizen Band Potawatomi tribe in Oklahoma. Um, allowed us to kind of piece the story together. So 1833, we talked about that was the Treaty of Chicago. This is uh, off a postcard that I got, try to make sure I have everything copyright approved. And um, two things really happened that, that brought us to today, where we have no federally recognized reservations in Illinois. One is the signing of this treaty. So 1833, treaty was signed, ceding five million acres, it wasn't the Chicago area that had already been ceded. It was everything north over to Rock River, and then I forget how far south. So it was basically the rest of Illinois and southern Wisconsin. And the second thing that was really significant was the President Andrew Jackson and signing of the Indian Removal Act in 1833. And so between those two things, uh, the 1833 treaty said, within two years, you need to leave Illinois. So we'll give you two years to get your things together and leave. So by 1837, they, or 1835, they left Chicago and had a big party here and you know, we found the trail that they took out. But that's really the reason why there are no federally recognized tribes here. But since then I've learned, how come we have 100,000 100, to 150,000 Native Americans now? 
Well, we had a couple of acts. I mean, continually the federal government tried to exterminate the Native Americans. So they had a relocation act. They put them out in the reservations. And then after World War, I think it's World War I or II. I can't, no, World War II, because it was in the 50s, that they said, okay, everyone can need to come back to the city and we'll give you jobs, we'll give you education. So then they got them off the reservation. And then they didn't want to pay the annuities to the reservation. So a lot of tribes got caught in this. And then, then they tried to go back that the tribe was dissolved. Like the Menominees up in Wisconsin had to fight for 20 years or so to get there, get reinstated as a federally recognized tribe. So tough road, tough road. So he was in Chicago. And then I decided um, I was going to, my husband and I, we were going to take my son to the University of Iowa to school. So we drop him off, and of course he's used to this by now. <laughs> I said, you want to go to Council Bluffs and see if we can find anything about Billy Caldwell? So we went over to Council Bluffs, so we skipped St. Joseph. But later I went back with my mom and um, a, another couple of people down there. But, so that's where I went next. And along the way, this is Caldwell's friend, Chabani, and he's in DeKalb. And he had, I can't remember how many acres, but let's say it's a couple, several hundred acres in a DeKalb area, it's called Chabonese Grove. And it's, I went out there, it's a beautiful spring, you know, fresh water there. It was gonna be a great place where he could have his people. And he had a huge family. And so he decided to stay, but he'd go back and forth to Iowa to see Caldwell. And one time when he was out there, uh, some settlers stole his land. And so then, but he was so well liked by the community, a little bit south, so that was DeKalb South in Morris. It's near Ottawa. They gave him some land, and that's where he's buried. They actually you know, create, put him in the Evergreen Cemetery there and kept him there. But you can see uh, he, was, he died 1859. So Caldwell dies 1841. So he lives a little bit longer than Caldwell. And so we have some history from him, and we have a picture of him. And this is his other buddy, Alexander Robinson. So Alexander Robinson lives to 1872. So we have a few more years where we've captured some information. So. As much as I'm crazy about Billy Caldwell, my friend's crazy about Alexander Robinson. So we've got a lot of notes for him. But Alexander Robinson's family is buried in this pink area. That's when I was talking about it. River Road and Lawrence. And then Laframbois had the property below him. So right, right along the river, some of the choice property in the Chicago area. So, wait. so I went up to Council Bluffs. My husband and I drove over there and we got there pretty late at night. And I, on the GPS, I knew Caldwell had been buried in a Catholic cemetery. So I put the Catholic cemetery in the GPS. And it takes us way out on this country road. And, you know, you never know. I mean, sometimes there's old pioneer cemeteries in somebody's backyard or something. So I just then the guy's walking down the driveway. And so I said to my husband, of course, he's used to this now. Do you think it'd be crazy if... <laughs> so I said, I, if I talk to the guy and he said, you're out here. We drove here. Go talk to him. So I went up and I said... Um, Hi, you know, I introduced myself and said I'm looking for the cemetery plot of a Native American that was here around 1841. And he looked at me and he said, are you looking for that dead Indian? I thought, <laughs> how many people are looking for a Saganash, so, or Caldwell? So um, he took us over to the cemetery. There's a Catholic cemetery. He was the office manager, so the address went to his house. But he drove us into Council Bluffs, and we went and looked at every headstone. We couldn't find anything. And then there's a, one cemetery, so you go in the cemetery and then there's a valley. And it says, there's a big like metal sign that's kind of on its side. It says Green Valley Cemetery. So of course I walked down there and it's you know, like 150 um, er, like brass and iron um, markers from the 1850s. So I don't know if it was a pauper cemetery or what, but the theory is, is that you know, perhaps he was buried in there. And of course they didn't have headstones back there and stuff. But, so anyway, um, the only thing in Council Bluffs are these two stones and the marking where the original black house was up on the bluff. So if I'm on Council Bluffs and the Missouri north here, south here runs down in front of me, on this side is Nebraska. It's flat as a pancake, right? So you can see how Lewis and Clark would be up on these bluffs because they could see for hundreds of miles probably. And so this fort where these two stones are was built for Caldwell. The Sioux Indian were to the north, and so they were trying to protect, you know, these Native Americans that were moving in there, and so they built this fort up there. The fort was taken down, 
in the 1940s, or maybe earlier than that. And they, they kind of blew the top off the hill, but they, they did move Caldwell's bones to the old Catholic cemetery. So when I went there, uh, we walked all around and we couldn't find anything, so I drove home and, of course, you know, you never know where you're going to get answers. So I said, well, I'm going to write the mayor. <laughs> so I wrote the mayor a letter and I introduced myself and I said, I'd like to do a fundraising campaign for a, a historical marker, something there. And so he introduced me to a woman who, in a history center like this, Mary Lou McGinn, Irish, and she's Catholic, so Caldwell was Jesuit. And she had been following Caldwell longer than me. So she filled in all the answers of what happened to him in Iowa. <laughs> and she was the one that helped us get him. Uh, we did a cemetery stone in the uh, Catholic cemetery. So this is a composite, on the right-hand side, you know, composite of what the fort looked like. I don't think it was actually that big. It was somebody's interpretation. I think it was more like a log cabin with, you know, maybe it's steeple put on it. But um, in the left, it's, it's kind of, you know, a mess, I know. But I just love the geography of Iowa. You have this huge river, the Missouri River, run, river running down. And then you have all these feeder creeks going into it. And if you've ever been to Council Bluffs, the bluffs are about 200 feet above the Missouri River, and you have Nebraska flat as a pancake. But the, the dirt is like a sand. It's like a yellow sand, and it just blows all the time. And there's really only a couple places in the, United, in the world that have this silt. And it's here, and one place is in China. Because when the glaciers retreated, and the only scratching going back and forth, it left this sand deposit, these bluffs. And so the reason I bring all that up is you have so much water with sand. Well, the river changes all the time. So getting the exact facts of you know, where the river was, where the camp was, we know it was up on that bluff because um, we have the old maps to it. But the one creek here, Mosquito Creek, I mean, that sounds miserable, doesn't it? <laughs> That's where Caldwell built his mill. And so we found some um, Mary Lou who was, like, I have to say I couldn't have put the story together without her. She, Caldwell built a mill, 1837. So he dies 1841, so you know, three, three, four years before he dies. The government was supposed to build this mill for him, but they never sent the money. And so he, they paid for it out of their own pocket. And we found the actual um, footings of the mill. It's, I'm not saying it's Caldwell's mill because it was such a great location. There were dozens of mills after him but we found the location of the mill. But, so we have some facts about what he did, trying to create, create commerce and trying to build houses and you know, use the logs to build houses and make the grain for the cattle. So here's the memorial that we put together. And every time I go by there, there's always stuff there. It's so neat. People leave you know, flags and feathers and flowers. And I went by a few weeks ago and there was tobacco sitting on there and it's just, it's so neat. I don't know who's going there, but I'm glad they are. So I put this map in because um, it's a Mexican map, but I love how it just shows, you know, you, you have Iowa, which is kind of at the top there, but um, on the west side of Iowa, you have Indian country. So that's, in the United States mind, Andrew Jackson's mind, just push him west of Missouri. We'll never use that land over there. <laughs> And today, most of the reservations are in Kansas and Oklahoma. So, um, but it, it's, you know, having worked with the tribes out there, it's, it's eye-opening to see what they've gone through and survive over all those years. So this is my last slide. I'm, um, I reached out to the Potawatomi tribe about eight years ago, and, you know, nothing. It takes a long time to work with Native Americans, a long time to build the trust with them. So over the time we did, and then I went out, I called them, I sent an email, uh, several emails, and they never got answered. So I got smart and I said, I'm gonna send it to the media person because they're paid to answer me. <laughs> so I sent it to the media person and she got back to me and we set up a Zoom. All the tribal council and me, and I, you know, here I'm this white woman, can I do a film, you know, about <laughs> Billy Caldwell and your tribe? And they said, well, come out and talk to us. So I went out and met with the elders and there were about 15 of them in a room and it was during COVID, so we all had our mask on and separated apart. And, Four hours, they grilled me and wanted to know what was in my heart. I mean, they really looked at me. And then at the end, the oldest one, I think she was 92 or 93, she kind of leans back in her chair and I'm like, okay, here goes. And she said, I think we need to do this film with you. 
you know more about our tribe than we do. <laughs> so, yay. <laughs> so I have an official partnership, a resolution. The tribe voted on a resolution. And we've been out there. That's the camera that I rented a couple crews from Kansas City. And they had that beautiful red chair and this old stone house. And the, on the left is into their park where they hold their powwows and art fairs and dinners and camping. And it's, it's all handmade out of steel. It's just beautiful. But um, so we finished all the interviews, and we're in post-production now, which means we're putting the film together. I, it's three acts. The first act is Chicago, so all about here. That's done. The second act is Iowa. What he finds in Iowa, his mill. There's a lot of drama in there because there's really nothing going on. It's desolate. And all they're doing is bringing whiskey up and down the Missouri River, and they get their annuities once a month, so they get the annuities. The whiskey would come. I mean, there's a lot of murder and things going on. So we have, it's very dramatic, and then we're going to let it calm down and <laughs> make it find a love story or something to bring you back up again. And then the third act is today's Potawatomi. So when Caldwell dies, 1841, the tribe, um, so that's 1841, five years later, 1846, there's a Treaty of Iowa, and that's where they say, okay, you're out of Iowa. We want you with the rest of the Indians west of the Missouri River. So they leave, but at that time the tribe splits, and it's a philosophical difference. One tribe, the Prairie Band Potawatomi, which is the tribe I'm working with, went to Kansas. I mean, there were some convoluted routes there. The other tribe, the Citizen Band Potawatomi, went to Oklahoma. Well, Citizen, as you can imagine, is they accepted citizenship, the United States government, which they got land allotments and stuff. The Prairie Band, they were like, you know, we're we're not going to accept allotments, and we believe in a, I'm going to use the word communal, I'm not sure they would use the word communal, but we believe in our tribe, you know, being together. So they had a tough time. They struggled through the 1800s, and then they accepted citizenship, and they're a federally recognized tribe. But that's where Billy Caldwell's family and friends, he didn't have any family. He did have family, but they stayed in Canada. But um, his friends went. So it's been really terrific working with them, and I've learned a lot about Native American, I'm honored that they would let me work side by side. They're co-producing the film with me, so it's not a white woman telling their story, which was really important to me. And it would be their voices, so. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>